So I've been, as I mentioned, thinking about this message for weeks, and it was actually inspired by a handful of conversations I've had recently with people who are fundamentally disappointed with life. It's not that they're miserable and frustrated all the time, but there is this sort of low-grade fever of disappointment that exists right under the surface of their lives. They, some of them talked to me about marriage. I thought marriage would be better than this. I thought my friends would be more accepting of me. I, I thought that I'd love life more. I thought that relationships and sex and money and possessions would be more satisfying. I, I thought that having kids would make me happier. And they get to a point in life where they've accomplished some of these things, they've experienced some of these things, and there's still a void inside. And it's not just big stuff. It's a lot of small stuff. Daily letdowns, daily disappointments with others, changing moods, bad habits that I can't break, driving desires that never get satisfied, dreams that go unfulfilled, problems that persist. I mean, this is the stuff of everyday life, all of our lives. My eloquent wife put it like this yesterday in a post on Instagram. <clears throat> Some days, I get momentarily confused. I have a terrible lapse in my 50-year-old memory, and I find myself expecting something from this world, this life, and the people in it that just isn't possible. Like a naive child, I expect this life and people in it, including myself, to be whole, not fragmented or dysfunctional. I expect kindness, love, helpfulness, dependability, forgiveness, trustworthiness. I mean, don't we all expect those things to some degree? Are we not all to some degree let down with people, with ourselves, with life? I mean, that's, that's the way life feels more often than not. We use the phrase low anthropology around here, and I know that's a, a big phrase, but all it really means is that we are weaker and worse than we like to admit, and we should adjust our expectations accordingly. That's all that it means. Anthropology is the, the study of human nature, and a high anthropology expects a lot from people. It expects them to be bigger and stronger and more capable and better than they can actually be. Low anthropology, which is what the Apostle Paul is talking about in Romans 7, uh, expects us to be weak, expects us to be worse than we like to admit. It means having a view of ourselves and others that admits that we all need help. In other words, it's an honest assessment, a realistic assessment of the human condition. It looks at people realistically, not idealistically. And what it sees is that none of us are angels. None of us. We're all imperfect people with a host of limitations and a, and a host of deficiencies. So I expect fallen people to fall down. I expect broken people to break things. In other words, I expect sinners to sin. If I didn't, I couldn't be a pastor. I would lose my mind. I would grow so incredibly impatient that I would quit. I expect you guys to screw up, okay? I expect your ego. I expect your pride. I expect to hear about your fears and your insecurities. I'm not surprised by that stuff. In fact, it helps me to not be judgmental, but instead to be empathetic. Having a low anthropology is not only a gift to yourself, it's a gift to other people. Because you don't find yourself growing increasingly impatient when someone who's broken breaks something. Or when someone who's fallen falls down again. You expect that stuff. So like I said, the only reason I'm able to be a pastor is because I expect that stuff. The only reason I'm able to be a husband, a father, is because I expect that stuff. The only reason I don't drive my wife and my kids and my extended family crazy is because I expect that stuff. Um, so if that's a good phrase to describe humans, low anthropology, we may need a similar phrase to describe life. 
Maybe we can call it low sociology. Sociology is kind of the, the study of human cultures and life in this world. That would be the idea that life is harder and less satisfying than we want it to be, and we should adjust our expectations accordingly there also. So we not only suffer from a high anthropology, expecting ourselves and others to be better than we are, but we also suffer from a high sociology, expecting life to be better than it is. And this is one of the reasons I absolutely love Romans 7. Love it. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Romans 8 is my favorite chapter in the Bible. Romans 7 is a close second. Um, Romans 7 is an expectation adjustment truth straight from God. And it saved my life many years ago in my early 20s. I, as you know, perhaps you don't know, um, grew up in a Christian home, middle of seven kids. Uh, at the age of 16, I dropped out of high school, got kicked out of my home. My parents essentially said, we love you, but if you're going to continue living this way, you can't live this way under our roof. And so they kicked me out of the house, and I was very happy about this because now that I wasn't in school and I wasn't at home, I didn't have teachers breathing down my neck, and I didn't have parents looking over my shoulder, living in Fort Lauderdale, I finally felt free to do whatever I wanted whenever I wanted to do it. Uh, and the Bible says that you know sin is pleasurable for a season, but when that season comes to an end, you're left with a gaping hole in your soul that only God is big enough to fill. And that season came to an end for me at 21 years old. It wasn't one particular thing or one particular crisis. It was just this culminating sense of there's got to be more to life than this. There's got to be more to who I am than what this world is telling me. Uh, and so like the prodigal son, I sort of made my way back home. Uh, and as a new Christian, I stopped doing the things that I had been doing, and I started pursuing the things that I ought to be pursuing, and God changed what it was that I got excited about, and he really did a deep work inside of me. He brought me from death to life, really. Essentially, that's what he did. Um, and I decided that it was important that I read the Bible. You know, growing up in a Christian home and going to Christian schools, Christian private schools my whole life, you know, the Bible was an important part of those places. Um, and being in church most of my life, being raised in church, I knew the Bible was an important book. I knew the Bible was where God spoke to us. And I thought it would be important for me as a new, fresh, young Christian to start reading the Bible. So I started, and I made my way through Genesis, Exodus, and made my way through those books relatively easy because I knew those stories. And then I got to Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, and I almost quit. It's like, what does this have to do with anything? I, I don't understand any of this stuff. Um, it was very meticulous and laborious. Uh, and then I sort of skipped to the Psalms, and I, I love the Psalms. Uh, and Proverbs, those are easy to understand. And then I got to the minor prophets and the major prophets and all the prophecies, and I got really confused, and I almost quit again. And so I decided to skip to the Gospels, to the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and some of the parables were confusing, but for the most part, I understood what was going on there. These were familiar stories to me. And then I got to Acts, and I loved the book of Acts, because it's basically just a history of the early church. And then I got to Romans. And Romans chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 are really heavy theological lifting. Actually, Romans 6 is too. And so I almost quit again. I was like, I kind of understand some of this, but I don't understand a lot of this. And then I got to Romans 7. And Romans 7 changed me. Because I encountered in the Apostle Paul someone who got me, someone who understood me. You see, when I was a new Christian in my early 20s, I expected to be getting better and for life to feel easier. Someone once said that every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before, but that wasn't true for me. That wasn't true for me. And I was suspicious that that wasn't true for the person who said it either. I felt like an even bigger mess and failure after I became a Christian than I did before. Life felt harder. So when I read Romans 7 and the Apostle Paul is saying things like, I thought I was a pretty good guy until God's law showed me that I wasn't. In fact, 
I didn't even know that I coveted until I read God's law, which said, do not covet. And then I discovered I wanted everything that didn't belong to me. And so it was knowing God, coming to know God that made the apostle Paul realize that he was worse than he thought he was, that he was more desperate than he thought he was, that he was weaker and more needy than he thought he was. So when I read those words, because that's the way I felt too, I was mightily comforted, hugely comforted. Um, a few times I almost threw in the towel to this whole Christian thing. I almost quit because I knew I couldn't do it. I wasn't doing it. I had heard the stories of people's lives changing dramatically and my life didn't really feel like that. I mean, I felt alive on the inside. I felt a connection with God that I had never felt before. But in terms of my desires and my habits and all of that stuff, I wasn't changing nearly as quickly as I thought I would be. Um, and so I almost quit. Uh, and then I read Romans 7. And like I said, I thought, this guy gets me. He's describing the way I feel. He's describing about himself the way I feel. He's not describing the way life ought to be. He's describing the way life is. He's a realist. And I loved that. It comforted me. It encouraged me to know that I wasn't the only one struggling. I wasn't the only one doubting. I wasn't the only one questioning whether this was legit. Paul did too. At the time, uh, I was going to a Christian college that championed the phrase, in fact, they were known for this phrase, the victorious Christian life. That sort of flavored everything they talked about in classes, in chapel. Um, in fact, I remember sitting in the president's office one time and sharing my story and how I continue to struggle in ways that I didn't expect now that I was a Christian. I remember sitting there like it was yesterday. And he listened very kindly. He was a, he was a very kind, soft-spoken man. And then he said something that I'm sure he thought would be encouraging to me. He said, Tullian, as you continue to strive to be more like Jesus, you will arrive at a point where you're no longer committing any known sins. You will be victorious. Well, if I didn't feel deflated before, I certainly felt deflated then. I'm thinking, are, are you kidding me? I can arrive at a place in this life, in this wretched life, this hard, difficult life with all of these hard, difficult people that are trying my patience all day, every day, that I can arrive at a place where I'm no longer committing any known sins? I mean, I, I, I know that he intended for that to be empowering and encouraging, but it was deflating. He was teaching me to expect more from me and this life than God ever promised. And that can be incredibly deflating. It can be incredibly defeating. And a lot of people give up on this whole thing because they've been taught something like that. Maybe not those words. Maybe something's been implied that it at the very least implies if you're a Christian, you should be getting better and better and cleaner and cleaner and stronger and stronger every day. And if you're not in the ways that we describe, then you might not even know God. Okay, there's a lot of people in this world. I hear from them all over the world who are ready to throw in the towel when it comes to this God thing because they've been told that they need to be better they need to be cleaner, that if they really knew God, their lives would look very different than the life that they have. Um, well, like I said, if I didn't feel deflated before that kind president said that, I sure felt deflated then. I mean, how does someone say something like that in light of Romans 7? How? Where Paul is not describing his spiritual victories, but rather his spiritual defeats. Theologians and certain Bible scholars, uh, they sort of do a bunch of verbal gymnastics to get around this whole idea. And what they end up concluding is that what Paul's describing here is not 
Paul as a Christian, he's describing himself before he became a Christian. Now, there's a fundamental flaw to that interpretation, and it's simply this, that throughout this entire chapter, Paul says things like, the, thing that I, the things that I want to do, I don't do. The thing, I, I, I love God's law, he says. I desire to do what God wants me to do. I just can't seem to do it. Well, someone who doesn't know God has no desire for God at all. They don't have a desire to do what God wants. They don't have a desire to obey God, follow God, listen to God. And yet Paul here is describing his deep-seated desire to do what God wants him to do, and yet he just can't seem to do it. So he's not describing himself before he knew God. He's describing the way life feels in a relationship with God. So uh, I remember sitting in cl- I had to write a paper in college about my interpretation of Romans 7. Not just my interpretation, but I had to do all sorts of research and find out over the course of the history of the church, how did different theologians and different Bible scholars interpret Romans 7, and how some came to the conclusion that this president had come to, and many others. Uh, and it never sat well with me, in part because it didn't make sense Uh, just grammatically, uh, theologically. But it also didn't make sense existentially, practically, functionally, emotionally for me. In fact, I was so, like I said, so encouraged, so helped, so comforted by the fact that Paul was describing the Christian life as it is. And in doing so, he was describing the way I felt too. You see, the truth is that Paul does us a huge favor here by lowering our expectations of ourselves. (laughs) He does us a huge favor here by lowering our expectations of others, of life in this world. What he's saying is that the only hope we have for ourselves is to give up hope in ourselves. Now, he does, I'm not saying give up hope. That's not at all what I'm saying. But to put our hope in the only place, in the only person that can actually carry us home. That's what he says in verse 24 and 25. uh, When he says in verse 24, Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. He has hope. He just has it placed properly in the one person, in the one place where hope can be sustained, where hope can be maintained, the one place, the one person who can carry him home. This is a, uh, this whole chapter is a classic law grace passage in the Bible. And what I, what I mean by that is simply this, that the Apostle Paul clearly lays out the role of God's law and the role of God's grace in this chapter. Both are good. You've heard me say that before, perhaps. Both are good. God's law is good because it comes from God. God's grace is good because it comes from God. Both are good because both come from God, but they do two very different things to us. God's law is intended to do one thing to us, And God's grace is intended to do something else to us. Paul makes it clear that the purpose of God's law is to expose us, to show us how much we need God's grace. That's what he says over and over in this chapter, that it was the law of God that exposed my need for the grace of God. It was God's demands to be perfect as he is perfect, that exposed my own imperfections. And and in exposing my own imperfections, I realized just how dependent on his grace I am. He says that in a variety of different ways over and over. The law, in other words, endorses the need for change, but is powerless to affect change. That's not its job description. It points to goodness, but can't produce it. It can instruct us on what is right, but it can't make us right. And a lot of people get that confused. They think that all you need to do in order for people to change is to show them how, when, and where they need to change. So just tell someone they need to change, and that'll get them to change. 
We do that with our friends. We do that with our kids. We do that with our spouses. We do that with a lot of people. We do that with ourselves. We think that simply telling someone or ourselves to change will affect the change that is necessary. Um, I mean, we can tell people what they need to be doing. But we're being naive when we assume that simply telling people what they need to do has the power to make them want to do it. That's not the way it works. You know that's true. Telling people they need to change can't change them. Paul makes that clear. He's saying the law is good. I mean, the law shows me what's right. The law shows me what's good. The law shows me uh, righteousness. My problem is I, I, I see the good, I want to do the good, and I don't. I see what's right, I want to do what's right, I just can't. So he's saying the problem is not in God's law, like there's some flaw in God's law. The, the problem is in here. The problem is in me. Um, I've said this before, but it is love not law, that is the essence of any lasting transformation that takes place in human experience. Any lasting transformation. Which is why I always say that none of us falls in love with someone who's constantly saying, love me better. You're not loving me well enough. Love me better. Many marriages that I know have fallen apart because both parties are constantly either explicitly or at least implying to their spouse, you're not loving me well enough, do better. And you know what happens to relationships in that sort of environment of criticalness and evaluation and constant assessment. It just, it falls apart. It doesn't breed intimacy. It creates division, um, so we don't, none of us falls in love with someone who's constantly saying, love me better. We fall in love with those who say, I love you no matter what, no matter what our hearts melt when we hear, I love you, especially when we know we don't deserve it, especially when we know down deep that we don't deserve it from the person who's saying it to us. See, life, and this is so important for us to understand, life isn't about getting better, getting stronger, being happy, feeling satisfied, having your dreams come true. If you think it is, you'll be sad and frustrated and persistently disappointed with yourself, with life, with other people. As they say in recovery circles, expectation is the mother of resentment. That's true. You'll be impatient with yourself. You'll be impatient with others. You'll spend yourself tirelessly looking for something or someone better. You'll constantly think the grass is greener on the other side. Aristotle nailed it when he said, it is the nature of desire not to be satisfied. And most human beings live only for the gratification of it. He nailed it. This is why life is marked by pain and struggle and tears. It has so much to do with our expectations. Life is hard anyway, regardless of our expectations. But our expectations might make life much harder if we expect people to be better, more loyal, more faithful, cleaner than they are, stronger than they are, more dependable than they are, and then they prove that they are broken humans, if we don't expect their broken humanness, that relationship will quickly come to an end. And we'll go looking for someone who we think is more dependable, someone who's more reliable, someone who's more faithful, more loyal, who can make my life better. We do this all the time. We do it with jobs. We do it with people. We do it with possessions. We do it with life in general. Um, so this is why life is marked by pain and struggle and tears. In fact, Romans 8 says the world and everything in it groans like it's in childbirth. I mean, I don't know how we can have a high anthropology or a high sociology just by reading Romans 7 and 8. 
Romans 7, Paul's talking about uh, just how jacked up he is. Romans 8, he talks about how jacked up the world is. Um, This is why so many of us are frustrated and disappointed. We thought it would be different. We thought it would feel different. We expect to arrive at some place that doesn't exist in this life. So you see, life, life isn't about those things. Well, if it's not about that, and that's kind of what they told us it was about, both inside the church and outside the church, if that's, if that's not what life is about, then, then what is life about? It's simpler than you think it is. Life is simply about hearing, I love you no matter what, in the middle of our failures, in the middle of our disappointments, in the middle of our sadnesses and our unfulfilled longings and our shattered dreams. Life is about knowing that you're safe and sound in the arms of an unlosable lover who promises to never leave you, who promises to never forsake you, who demands nothing from you and gives everything to you. Resting in that, knowing the truth of that, will set you free. It won't make our pilgrimage through this life less rough as a broken person living in a broken world with other broken people, but it makes it survivable. And it gives us a little bit more patience and a little bit more perspective as we make our way through this world, as we live in the relationships that we do. See, God God doesn't promise to fix us in this life. He doesn't. What he promises is something far better. He promises to love us unconditionally and unashamedly in our unfixedness. That's his promise. He doesn't promise to rescue us from the valley of the shadow of death, as David says in Psalm 23. He promises to be with us in the valley of the shadow of death. See, the hope of grace is not that we will, in this life, get past our hurts and disappointments, our guilt and our feelings of regret. It's not that we will have a good and easy life that is fulfilling in all the ways we want it to be. The hope of grace is that God promises to be with us in our hurts, in our disappointments, when we struggle with guilt and regret, when life is bad and hard and unsatisfying. The ultimate issue, the ultimate issue is the steadfast love of God that never ceases. That's the issue. That's our hope. Brennan Manning in his amazing book, The Ragamuffin Gospel, which I've recommended before and I will recommend it again. It's not a difficult read. If you're looking for a book to read and you've read all of my books, those are first, okay? <laughs> just, I don't care if you read them. Just buy them. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> Brennan Manning's book, The Ragamuffin Gospel, is, uh, I mean, top, top of the totem pole. And I love what he says in it. He says, when... When I get honest, I admit that I am a bundle of paradoxes. I believe and I doubt. I hope and I get discouraged. I love and I hate. I feel bad about feeling good. I feel guilty about not feeling guilty. I am trusting and suspicious. I am honest and I still play games. To live by grace means to acknowledge my whole life story, the light side and the dark. In admitting my shadow side, I learn who I am and what God's grace means. As Thomas Merton put it, a saint is not someone who is good, but someone who experiences the goodness of God. There's a Catholic theologian who said that faith is like relaxing. And what he meant by that is, how do you feel when you're in the presence of someone you know loves you no matter what? You know, you you tend not to wear masks as much. You tend to be more honest. You tend to be less defensive. You're, You're more free. You're relaxed. And this 
Theologians said that's, that's what faith is. It's relaxing in the presence of one who is fond of you no matter what, who loves you no matter what. So, um, so maybe, maybe you'll get better. Maybe you won't. Maybe you'll kick the habit. Maybe you won't. Maybe your marriage will improve. Maybe it won't. Maybe your son will call you. Maybe he won't. Maybe you'll find love. Maybe you won't. None of that is ultimately the issue. Ultimately. As I said, the ultimate issue is the steadfast love of God, which never ceases. Whether you kick the habit or not, whether your marriage improves or doesn't, whether you get better, however that's defined, or you don't. I've said to you many times that I look over the course of my life, the last 50 years, 51 now, uh, and, um, and, you know, I look back and I go, in some ways I've gotten better. In some ways I've gotten worse. In most ways I've kind of stayed the same. I mean, I still get frustrated at the same things I got frustrated at years ago, long lines, traffic jams, stupid drivers on Indian Town Road. Um, I mean, I, I still find myself struggling with some of the same issues of pride and ego and jealousy that I had since I was a kid. Um, you know, in some ways, I've, I've gotten better. I may not act out as foolishly as I used to when I was younger. In some ways, I've gotten worse. I've said this before that uh, when I acknowledge the ways I've gotten worse, it's actually a sign that I'm getting better. And when I become proud of the ways I've gotten better, it's actually a sign that I'm getting worse. So most things just stay statically the same. And if we're honest, we admit that. The ultimate issue is the fact that God's love never blinks, never bails. That God doesn't love us because of our worth we are of worth because God loves us. That is what gives us dignity. That's what gives us the stuff we need. Um, so, so what if the secret to some kind of peace in this life is a growing awareness of our need for help? What if that's the secret? What if the key to being okay has more to do with accepting our limitations and being honest about our not okayness? What if real recovery is marked by a growing acceptance of the fact that we will, in this life anyway, never fully recover? That we can be healed, but not whole. And that's okay, because we're loved. What if, what if that's what it's about. Think about that. Think about how that would change the way you view yourself, how that would change the way you view the people in your life. Think about how that would affect the next argument with your significant other. Or if you're dealing with their selfishness or they're dealing with your selfishness, or when you're dealing with your children's disobedience or whatever the case may be. Think about it. Think about the gift that a low anthropology and a low sociology has, not just to us, like I said, but to the people around us. We become a little bit more patient, more gracious, maybe more merciful, more quick to forgive, fruit of the spirit kind of stuff. Um, I want to, before we take communion together, which I love doing here, especially here, um, I want to just read you something that I wrote in this book that I finished this past year. The book doesn't end with these words, but this is close to the end. This is like maybe the third to the last paragraph. These days, I live with a seemingly incurable low-grade fever of sadness because of the people that I hurt and some of the relationships I lost. It's the grievous wound of used to be that will not heal. 
I live with lopped off limbs. But some place or picture of arrival is not what I'm grasping after. If I'm reaching at all, it is to receive what's been so graciously given. Stacy's love, a family of screwed up misfit friends, the voices of my children and grandchildren, sunsets and ocean breezes. Poet Maya Popa captures this sentiment perfectly in the title of her book, Wound is the Origin of Wonder. Perfect book title. That it is, and I'm grateful for the wonder that now marks my wounded rattletrap life. Frederick Buechner famously wrote, here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. That's the abundant life, my friends. Experiencing the abundance, all of it, the beautiful and the terrible and everything else in between, every damn stitch right in the cardia. Those are realistic expectations. Being grateful for the gifts that God has so graciously given us. Remembering that the people around us are just as scared and just as insecure and just as weak and wounded as we are. They may act it out differently, but we're broken. And the person sitting next to you is broken. And the people living in your home are broken. And the people, even the people driving down Indian Town Road are broken. <laughs> this world won't be broken forever. And you won't be broken forever. There is coming a time. And there is coming a place where everything sad will become untrue. Where every tear will be wiped. Every wound will be made whole. And we will be able to work and worship with unbounded energy and passion forever. Without sin interrupting that stuff. That day is coming. But not yet. We've been promised a safe arrival. We have not been promised a smooth voyage. And that is really helpful to remember. And one of the ways that we remember that is by taking communion together, by coming to the Lord's table and receiving. It's one of the reasons why I love both baptism and the Lord's Supper, because these are sacraments, sacraments that don't celebrate our commitment to God. Some people have sort of made us believe that. That taking communion and getting baptized is a demonstration, publicly or otherwise, that we are committed to God. But that's not what this is about. This is not about demonstrating our loyalty to God. It's about receiving God's loyalty to us. It's about being reminded of God's faithfulness to us, God's goodness to us, God's devotion to us, in spite of the fact that we don't deserve it. That's what it's about. So when we come forward and take the Lord's Supper together, we're doing it in a celebratory manner. I mean, how, how good can it get? We, we, we don't deserve any of it and we get it all? I mean, what's not to celebrate? What's not to sing about? What's not to smile about and laugh about and dance about? When you bask when you bask in just the, the sunshine of God's unconditional love for you, it's warming, warming.